Today's guest is someone who brings fantasy to life with no other. From nursing patients with an incredible care to creating an entire magical realm that is seemingly merging their love for storytelling, martial arts, and cosplay into a powerhouse career inspired by a simple story told to a patient. This author has created The Birth of Fate, a series that places them on the cover of their own books, making them one of a few feature fantasy authors to ever do so. With a passion for cosplay and a background in martial arts and a love for fantasy, the world this guest often hails as the new queen of fate. It is my honor to introduce Danielle Osano. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Did I, did I do you justice with the intro? You did me justice with the intro. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So let's just jump right into it. You know, you've been the cover on your own books in the full fake cosplay, which is incredible, by the way. What was that moment like when you first saw yourself as a live embodiment of that character? Did it change how you, you know, saw your own story or how the readers connected with you? At first, I did um, test shoot. That's where the pictures actually came from. They were never supposed to be on the covers. That was not my idea. It was never oh. my intention. Uh, my former publisher, I had all my covers planned out, to be honest with you. I don't know if you know a lot about authors, but we tend to put a little more thought and we think we have these grandiose ideas for covers. Uh, my original thought was I'm going to do this whole ombre of blue to represent Bay blood and how the story goes. And Yeah. Okay. That got thrown out the door. You know, I was like all set with it and they were just like, ah, uh, no. So yeah. they're the ones who saw the pictures and they came back and did the first cover and they were like, this yeah. is what we're doing from now on. So the original shot, the mermaid, first of all, was done for Fame magazine. And oh. we were kind of going back and forth. Are we going to use it? Are we not? It was a whole thing. So I owned the pictures. Uh, some of the other ones were test shots I did just to get in fake character. Because I cosplayed as Harley Quinn and Wonder Woman and all these other. Okay. But I never did my own characters. So I did it just to see, does a cape work? Would they have long hair? Would they have short hair? Probably. Would they really have leaves? Like I did one of the Will-O-Wisps and I actually put on a leaf thing I made. It was like, does this work? Does it not? How big would the wings be? It was really just an experiment. And from there, we kind of moved forward. So when I originally did Queen Aurora, her original crown was um, like gold branches. Because I thought maybe that's what she would do. Mm. It then turned into something totally different. So these were kind of the rough ideas. And then from there, it was a jumping off point. So it was a little, I wasn't really thinking, oh, this is the character. Oh, okay, okay, it, it okay. It was just starting out. So that, that's pretty awesome. And, and so you, uh, you said basically that moment, your first embodiment of cosplay. What was your initial reaction with them actually choosing that and moving forward with that and, and, and with the public reaction? How, how did that, uh, I guess, culminate into you consistently doing that with your book series? No, I wasn't happy. I'll be honest with you. I was really terrified. Um, I looked at them and I was like, ah, uh, no. It was just flat out, no, 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 we're not doing this. Once again, we're going to go with my idea. And then I realized I didn't have a choice. I was really nervous because I'm already being judged for what's inside. Yeah. And everybody goes, oh, don't judge by book by a cover. Cover. We're judging the book by a cover because that's what's going to yeah. get you to buy it. So now mm -hmm. I'm on it. It was like, this is too much. I can't, I can't. So I was really, really nervous. I did not want to do it. I'm also not 20 years old. So I was like, and if I did it, I told them, I don't want to be airbrushed. Like, we're either going to do this or we're not. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not 20 years old. So if we're going to do it, let's show me. But at the same point, you're like, well, I'm not 20 years old. You know, you could like airbrush all here, there. I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, and so you're know, you walking this fine line. Um, yeah. You don't want to do like, you know, the Kardashian thing. And yeah. then you're kind of like, but they always look good. So you, all of a sudden you go from like sitting, judging, watching something like that. going, I wouldn't do that. No, no, no. You know, to, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so what's that filter called? <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. it's back and forth. So yeah. I was not thrilled um the reaction was my father didn't even recognize me like i showed him the cover and he's like who's the blonde chick and i'm like um that's, the blonde chick is your daughter like that's, that's me and i was like yeah it was one of those moments and he was like 
why are you dressed like a fish? And I'm like, oh, this is really, this is not doing much for my confidence right now. Um, you know, like, it was one of those things. And then I only had enough pictures for the first two covers. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, for the first cover. And then it was like, oh, I have to do more. I don't have, like, so we had to start shooting. I was not paid for them. I was not reimbursed for them. So if we were doing this, it was like, oh, I got to make more costumes. I got to do more photo shoots. Okay. So, so so you make your own costumes as well? I make some of them. Some of them I got to get help with uh, for the second one, Thine Eyes of Mercy. That course, it was made by Rainbow Corsetry. We worked together. The rest of okay. it I made. Oh, wow. uh, the crown, actually, Jamie from Enchanting Earth. We worked together to do the Aurora crown, which she then sold for a limited time. But that's been mm. my crown ever since. And then we, you know, it was written into the book. Yeah. Uh, let me think. For From the Ashes, I made the Harbinger swords. Those I made. And the uh, the vest I bought but then had to make, like the piece, the skull piece and the cape, that I did. So it's always kind of a joint effort. Kingdom okay. Come. <laughs> oh, that one got me. That one got me. Um Jarvat armor, except for his headpiece, the uh, rest is me. Wow. That was that one put me over the edge, I'll tell you that. Because we used I'm... that in the original trailer. Uh, but let me tell you something about acrylics and resin. It does not last very long. <laughs> so that one needed some doctoring. But uh -huh. to make skull, I had to learn quick and I wound up using uh, ice cube trays. But wow. all the little details on him, those are tiny little resin pieces of resin I had to do. So see, you, you, I couldn't yeah. even tell that. Like, oh, really? Cool. Thank yeah. you. Because yeah, no, that's not metal. Those are, yeah. those are little pieces of resin that I little dot mm -hmm. that I did. And my poor dogs were like, at one point, they ran into each, like they ran into the table where I had the mica, and it looked like seen out of Sleeping Beauty, like half pink, half blue. And poor Penelope, it was covered in things. It was just, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, yeah. For for a Faye is done, that picture was from our original photo shoot way back when we were testing. So okay. I happened to have that, but I made that dress. So that we had, that was from my clothing line from years ago. And I just happened to save it because I loved it. And I'm like, well, guess what? We got to do a butterfly girl. We got a butterfly dress. So you've been an entrepreneur, like, for how long? Because... You have so many different skills and facets. And it's like, it came together, seems like at the right time. You know, from being an author to doing cosplay to actually creating your own, like, your um your own gear. Like, and from a previous quote, hey, I mean, how many jobs you got? Oh, yeah, I'm a master of trade, you know, a jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, like, like I what? dabbled in everything at some point. And yeah. I always joke that I was a rebel against the universe. Like, I kept fighting it, and the so universe good. was like, yeah, no, that's not where you're supposed to go. Okay, you're going to try this for a little while. Okay, now we have to, like, we have to blow this up because you're still not listening to us. It was that kind of thing where yeah. I, try, like, I don't want, I don't know if you ever watched Parks and Rec, but yeah. I was a little Tom Haverford. Like, I was always trying to, like, get my swerve on, like, figure this stuff out and back and oh. forth, and then it would fall apart, and I'm like, that's okay, I'll get the next one. Oh. And I would just do this constantly. Until the universe was like, no, 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 mm -hmm. sweetie, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I always joke it kind of throws a pebble, then a bigger rock, then a bigger rock, then a brick, and then finally a boulder lands on you. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, yeah, Bugs Bunny or the wily e. Coyote under it, just your ears and your ar the arms sticking out. It's like, okay, you ready to listen now? But see, with me. see that, but that's cool how. You didn't allow that to bring you down. You know what I mean? It's like, you you know, things happen, situations happen. It's like for most people, I know for myself, like when a situation happens and I feel like, hey, I was really supposed to do that. And then, like you said, I got smashed by that boulder. I will stop doing anything. But you said, okay, let me go in a different direction. And that's pretty amazing. Oh, that's pretty awesome. So I, I wanted to ask you a question, you know, you wore many hats, like I said, and you was a nurse, martial artist, author, cosplay. Um, having each of those experiences shaped who you are with storytelling, 
does that your time in the medical field still influence your creative writing, you know, especially in that process? Oh, it definitely does. My dragons are medically based in a sense. Yeah. Um, I built them from the digestive system. I didn't think about how they looked first. I just I mean, didn't want to. Yeah. So what I did was I thought, I hate when dragons are just magical and it's like, they just bring yeah, fire. Yeah. That's how it is. I always hated that. I'm like, but why? There's a creature that actually makes fire in it. Like that mm. always to me was just like, whoa. So when I decided to have dragons, because, you know, they're vernacular. Like you just need them in the fantasy world. I thought about it and I was like, I took it from a nursing medical perspective. Mm. And I was like, okay, they have to produce it. How do we make it? So I started with our digestive system, bacteria that we create what we need for a fire ice acid drag mm. and kind of put them in buckets and then research the bacteria. Okay. How would that work? So now physiologically, what would they need? What's the anatomy? Mm. What's the physiology? Started to build it out that way. Then I went to my vet, Dr. Gil Stanzione. And sat and I walked in and I went, okay. So he was like looking at my dog, Carlos. And I'm like, I have a question. And he's like, yeah. And then I told him and he just, I remember he took his glasses off. He went, oh. and, he, and as I explained it to him, he went, he stopped and he went, that's actually not a bad idea. Yeah. And he put his head out the door and he's like, give me five more minutes with her. And he closed it. And he's like, okay, let's talk about this. And so we talked about it and it was like, he's like, you're on to something. And from there, it built out. And that wow. changed the appearance, all of it. I met Pandy Van, who's my uh, illustrator, and I gave her very specific details. And I was like, mm. they've got to have this. And she'd come back and be like, um, ice dragons don't have cartilage tusks. I'm like, no, mine does because, and it needs mm -hmm. to look like this. Mm. Then I went to uh, a mechanical engineering professor, physics professor. And I was like, they need to fly. And they were just like, uh, and I'm like, no, 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 here they are. And I was like, they're not the size of 747. They're bigger than a giraffe, but that's it. And they yeah. were like, so then they made it the midterm exam for their student. Plausible dragon. And they gave them all the information and they had to present me with it. And that's where we started coming up with, can these dragons fly? If I was ever on Mythbusters, I just wanted to be plausible. It didn't have to be confirmed. I just didn't want oh. Neil, Grace, Tyson, Degrassi, whatever the heck his name is coming after me. <laughs> so I was just like, I just want to be, you know, like, yeah, okay, yeah. that might happen. And that was it. So everything was influenced by that. Where did this drive, this push come from? Because, you know, um, I'm not sure if you watch motivational stuff all the time, but I do. So, um, I, Will Smith talked about going from good to great and how good is 90% and great is 100. And that la the difference between 90 and 100 is like light years away. It seems, especially with the success of your books, that you took being great, literal, like when it came to, you know, anything like, like you said, with the digestion of the dragon to actually building that out to what it needs to have for its environmental, going to colleges and actually have people discussing mythological dragons and what would they actually look like and how would they actually fly? Like you really took it serious. Do you think that culminated into the success that you have with your book series? It all came from martial arts. I would like to tell you this is dope. This is just me. Nah, I was a pain in that kid. You know, I was too busy playing Wonder Woman. I had, you know, tinfoil bracelets on. I just wanted nothing to do with life. No, it, my instructor uh, was John McLaughlin. He was my Taekwondo instructor and Perfect. he threw me in my first tournament. He did not tell me about it. He just literally dropped me off and was like, here you go. You're going to compete. And this is it. I won the tournament. And then he said, if you want more, go by yourself. And after that, he did not come with me. It was, you know, but he, the one thing he said to me, I remember years later, he said it was the worst thing he could have said. He took it too literally. When you're not, when you're not practicing the girl who's going to beat you is. And that like was like, that. I like that. What? And it just stuck with me. And I was right. in there constantly because yeah. once I won, it's almost like the first game of the year for the NFL. Mm -hmm. Somebody's undefeated. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got it. After I won my first one, I'm like, technically I'm undefeated. I want to stay this way. This is cool. 
and that became my thing. I was like, yeah. no. I'm, and every time I heard, well, nobody's done that. And everybody tell me, you're yeah. too short. You can't do a middle split. You can only do American side split. You need to do a middle split. You have to have a vertical side kick. You're really small. I'm like, really? Okay, then. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you can't win open, you know, open tournament divisions, like open forms, mm -hmm. doing a traditional form. Oh, I can't? Okay. Well, that's funny, because Michael J. White just judged me and gave me overall grand champion against open division and musical people doing backflips. So wow. I'm thinking I can. You know, it became yeah. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you know, I always kind of joke, I use that Harley Quinn quote. Oh, you told me, you thought you could tell me what I can do? I'm Harley freaking Quinn. You know, it became yeah. that. Like, yeah. no, 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 no. So that was more it. If I like something, I throw myself in it. Mm. A little too much. If I don't like it, it's kind of like moving a mountain to get me to do it. Yeah. You know, I got you. I'm, I'm the same way. My wife consistently has to fight with me to do things. Uh, I, I'm a guy, I love to be a part of the, uh, the thick of things. I like to execute. So, like, if I have an idea and it's creative and I think, you know, it gets people and involves people, man, I am all for it. But if it's anything else, I'm like, eh. and yeah. funny enough, I'm more of an introvert, right? So I like to Don't stay mind. to myself and not really be bothered with people. So, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I guess, a, a push and pull with that. But uh, also, you, very you, you, hey, you know, and you, you did say something very interesting and I wanted to get to it, but I, uh, we can get to it now with your martial arts. Do you think your discipline, uh, the discipline needed in martial arts, that same discipline reflects in your writing? Um, I don't know if it necessarily reflects in the writing. Because okay. uh, I've always said, like, if you, if you want to do something wrong, come talk to me. Like, I've done it all wrong uh, yeah. when it comes to writing. You know, yeah. I've made every mistake. But I think my warrior characters are very disciplined in that sense. Gotcha. I don't have any haphazard warriors. Uh, they may be annoying. Uh, they may be clicky at times. But when it comes to fighting, they're right on. They'll, they'll get your back. They, you know, I have two characters, Priya and Yagora, who are your typical mean girls in the dark fight. Uh -huh. But when something's going down, they're ready to go and they're good fighters. Gotcha. So I think that's probably how it kind of comes to be. And... Um, I have a, a book, Fire, Ice, Acid, and Heart, and it's a dragon tournament, but it's dodgeball meets a martial art tournament put together. So I think my martial arts comes through in my fight scenes, and it influences little pieces, but I don't know if it overall influences the story through discipline. And I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, your martial arts. You won a bronze medal in a traditional, non-traditional age, right? Where it was like, it was like, oh, you're too old. How did that all come about? I actually, I won the silver medal at the WKA World Championships in 2008. I won it doing wushu, which if anybody knows anything about wushu, it's like kung fu meets gymnastics. So the Thank best you. example I can give you is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Okay. You can just take the supernatural aspect out of it. And uh -huh. there you go. I always wanted to do wushu. That was like one of the, one of the styles I had to learn. And at an older age, you know, and when I mean older age, starting wushu is usually at like five years old. Yep. Anything over 20 is considered older. You yes. put a 30-year-old in there, they're like, what you doing? You know, you <laughs> go older than 30 and they're like, you must be crazy. Really? I decided I had to do it because I've won everything doing hard style. Taekwondo okay. is a hard style. I wanted to culminate soft style. So um, I threw myself into Wushu, doing Eagle Claw of all things, which is like a two-minute form, you know, standing on one leg, pretending yeah. to be an eagle. I mean, I look at it now, and I'm like, what was I thinking? And then, you know, I had to do a musical form, yeah. so of course I picked Wonder Woman, and, I, and I'm still doing soft style. Mm -hmm. It's like I learned an aerial for the first time, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I look at it now, and I'm like, oh. And then I went to go train with, you know, Jing Bong Joon down in Chantilly, Virginia, who is the ambassador of Eagle Claw to the U.S. He was on the Wushu team at the same time as Jackie Chan, Jet Li. Yeah. And I decide I'm going to go down there and I'm going to go train with him. He's going to be impressed. Yeah, he was not impressed at all. This man is not <laughs> nothing <laughs> impressed him at all. I'm doing like a vertical front snap kick and I'm like, check this out. I drop into a split. I'm like, what do you think? And he literally looks at me 
And he's like, you know, I do a backflip into a full layout and land on my stump. And I'm like, oh, he's like, I invented that. And I'm like, oh, oh really? Yeah. Really? You took you? <laughs> okay. And, you know, all of a sudden you just look at him and go, oh. and then I looked at the guys I was yeah. training. I'm like, you could have mentioned that he taught that. You know, I'm like, third stories. So I'm, somebody couldn't, you know, because I'm thinking I'm impressive. And we started doing laps. And the first eight minutes is nothing but run straight around his gym. And I'm like, okay, somebody could have told me I was doing this. And he mm -hmm. comes up next to me, and I thought he was riding a scooter. He was so smooth. And then I look down, and he's running next to me. His upper body is not bobbing, nothing. And I'm like, he's not human. And he's like older, older, old. Like we're talking Jackie Chan age at this point. And I'm looking mm. at him going, uh, and he's like, keep up. And he just like <laughs> trots off. And then we're done. And we're all like, ooh, huffing and puffing. And he's like, stretch. And I'm like, okay, where are the bars? And he tells me, find a crevice on the cement wall and put my leg on it. And I'm like, crevice. And I'm looking. It was just cement blocks. He just met like in between them. And he just puts his leg up there and leans in. And I'm like, um. No, that's what he means. Four hours. We had two sessions, two four-hour sessions. Mm -hmm. After the first four hours, we were staring at the van trying to figure out how we were going to get in. Because we were so sore that we were all looking at each other. And they were like, okay, we're going to lift you up. Then you pull us in. <laughs> and we were, and I'm like, we have to go back. Like, that's fine for now. We yeah. still have to go back. It was just, yeah, I don't know. I won the so silver long, medal. Yes. That's happening. So how long did you train with him? We, we can only afford him for a day. Okay, let me just start with okay. that. And he normally okay. did not take any. He oh, had wow. his own place. He didn't take anybody. We mm -hmm. were lucky that he took us. I was still grateful to that man. And he gave us, he gave me tips throughout because he knew I was going to compete. But as I was leaving, one of my partners went, how old is too old to start Wushu? And he looked at him and he goes, he, he just looked, he goes, over 20. He goes, <laughs> How about over 30? And I looked at him and I was like, I'm going to beat you. <laughs> Jing Mong, you just started laughing. He's like, that's stupid. Nobody would do that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and I'm they just like, over. I'm going to. And I'm like, when I can lift my hands, which I don't know when that's going to be, I'm going to get your foot. And we're getting out. And, and Jing Mong, you just kept laughing. He's like, who would do that? And oh, I'm like, Lord. they were like, start playing chi. Do something else. Not wushu. And I'm like, I just, you could see the steam coming out of my head. I was so mad. I get in the car and I'm like, I can feel everything again. Here to go and killing all of you. It, it <laughs> was, like, yeah. I retired after that. I was like, I'm right. I, I took my silver okay. medal and I looked at Mickey and I'm like, we out. I'm, I am done. My body's been through and all. Done. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I do have a, a question. We always talk about all that. It's like, so, and it's, you know, you know, you talked about cosplay a lot, you know, especially like Wonder Woman and stuff. How has cosplay evolved as a form of self-expression for you? Cosplay started out, I was cosplaying and I didn't even know the term cosplay. Like, I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. The first time I dressed up outside of Halloween and the whole thing, I wore, I made a Wonder Girl, like a Deborah Winger from the TV show outfit and wore it under my doba when I was doing my green belt test. Because I had to break a board and the head of my organization who hated my gut was coming down to judge me. So I made the uh, outfit wore it under it as my little, like, I can do it thing. My instructor saw it, not happy at first at all. And he was just like, do you have the bracelets? And I'm like, they're in my locker. I was like, I don't want anything to happen to him. He's like, go get the bracelets. Because he knew the test was not going well. Like, this guy hated me. And uh, that was the first time I dressed up, like, outside of everything. Uh, from that okay. point on, I would dress up as Wonder Woman and make, like, the cape or do something little. But I didn't know. There was a whole community about it. I had no idea. Yes. I went to New York Comic Con. Change. Change your whole perspective, huh? Yeah, I was just like, people do this? And I'm like, I'm not like a nut. It was just kind of that aha moment. And I'm like, this is where I belong. I shall not leave. You know, and from there, I was like, I could do this. And so uh, the next time I went, I went as Yvonne Craig's girl. Okay, okay. And started like, wow, this is really cool. Like, I could do this a lot. I can have fun. And it just kind of started, you know, you start making a little extra. You make something yeah. more. 
and you kind of get into the flow of who you want to be. Mm -hmm. And there were so many great people. And the, the community is so nice, especially at the Javits Center. I don't care what anybody says. I find the Javits Center to be, you know, New York Comic Con to just be a very accepting and welcoming community to first timers, to whomever. I think uh, they're just great people there. So I loved it. And from there, it was just, let's do a little more. Let's do a little more. And I found it to be a little bit of a relief from the pressure mm -hmm. of just every day. Mm -hmm. like, nobody's going to ask me to do anything. You know, I would go even when I was nursing. And it's like, nobody's going to ask me for anything. Don't give any medical information. Yeah. Nobody's pulling at me. I can just relax. And that's and, why I thought it was so cool. And question, with the cosplay, do you do any LARPing as well with that? Um, I've only done, like, photo shoots, like, group photo shoots. And the LARPing kind of takes place in there, you okay. know? Like, I've gone and, you know, when I've been Catwoman, I've got, like, five Batmans and a Joker coming up and being like, okay, so this is what we're going to do. And it kind of evolves into something, mm -hmm. usually. Uh, or if I'm Harley Quinn, there's always a Joker who's like, you know, who's like, I'm your pudding. And all of a sudden they want to do pictures kissing hands and like with the mallet. And they want to do all the Joker Harley Quinn posts, poses. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say it's LARPing, but it's something on that level. Okay. With kind of the poses, because there's there's always a matching character that wants to yep. do something cool with you. Always, yep. So it, it kind of evolves into that. Mm. Okay. So you know, you mentioned a lot about comic books and uh, working with your huge inspiration. How do you feel comics have shaped your writing style and your vision for storytelling? I think comic books one are very under is very underrated. The whole uh, genre in general, the medium. It's very underrated. I agree. I agree. For its storytelling abilities and what it can convey. Okay. I think a lot of times it's just pushed to the side. And by the time people catch up, that writer's passed on or it's cliche. Uh, I think George Perez is, lo I love George Perez. I think what he did with Wonder Woman is great. But I look at somebody like Stephanie Williams and what she did with Nubia, and I don't think she gets the credit she deserves. Uh, to take a character like Nubia, who a lot of people were at the time were just like, uh, you know, we haven't seen her in years. And bring yeah. her in to Wonder Woman the way she did and give her a very clear backstory, I think was amazing. And yeah. I don't feel she gets the credit she deserves. And she's been doing it uh, on, in, on Wonder Woman in Nubia because that, that backdrop was set. We all knew the backstory of the Amazons of Themyscira. So to take that character, inject her in, and still be able to build around a standing set, I think is incredible. Uh, so I think... Sometimes with comic books, the medium isn't taken as seriously, or by the time we ca they catch up, it's mm -hmm. like, we all know Todd McFarlane. You're just getting to it now? Yeah. yeah. There's so many new people doing different things. You know, you look at AWA, and, you know, Charlemagne the God's got his stuff coming out. There's mm -hmm. so many new aspects of it that I wish people would kind of turn into it and take it more seriously just than, like, Oh, it's the new thing, you know, because superhero movies. Okay. So I, I think there's more to it and what they do, especially with from a storytelling perspective, because when you look at it, you look at the omniscient point of view. Yeah. That's been comic books this entire time. You're yeah. always looking down and getting the entire flow. It's yeah. never just Rove's point of view talking to Gambit. Mm -hmm. You're watching the two of them interact. It's always omniscient. Mm -hmm. So while people are like, oh, omniscient is kind of cool now in literature, you're like, that's been going on this whole time. What, what, is, what are you catching up with? How many times do you watch Spider-Man swing through and he's talking to himself? It's not his point of view. Because yeah. in the next scene, it's him and Doc Ock. And you're getting yeah. Doc Ock's point of view and his thought. So this has been omniscient the whole time. Uh, Thank you. Glad you're catching up to this. But <laughs> it's been here. So uh -huh. I, I think that's where the literary devices that are in there don't get the credit. And for me... As somebody who's dyslexic, it's easier to look at something visually and understand it and keep up and read emotion. So uh, I think that's where it got me personally. And then uh, I didn't, I never understood anti-hero, villain. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're watching like the Super Friends and things like that. And you're like, okay, let's blue Thor bad. You know, Cheetah bad. Yeah. Then I read Dark Phoenix and I'm like, wait a minute, what's this? Yeah, I yeah. got Jean Grey, 
you know, and then I got dark, dark feet in Jean Grey's body, the Phoenix, you know, and I was like, yeah. okay, I care about her, but I don't. <laughs> it was like, because yeah. no, 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 no. It's like, I know uh-huh. the Joker. So that blew me away, the killing joke. Those things changed how I look at writing, you know, mm. storytelling. And I knew when I did start oh. writing, I could never do a first person. So, because of so, comic. so do you think that that narrative pace of comic books influenced the way you build action suspenses in your novels? Oh, yeah. I love cliffhangers. People hate me for it. I love cliffhangers. <laughs> I will leave you on a cliffhanger and I don't think twice about it. I really don't. I mean, people hate me for it, but I have no problem killing main characters. Uh-huh. I love that. I love that, by the way. I, I I absolutely love when um an author kills a main character. It's like, okay, what are we doing here? We're in. Like, yeah. I'm like, this is serious. I have no problem killing a main character at all. Uh-huh. I like when characters change. I don't like when it's the same emotional journey and they stay stagnant. I like arc. I like regression. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, they're getting better. They're getting better. They're getting better. And that's the whole thing. And you're like, Aren't they going to fall backward? Like, everybody slides back. Nobody continues upward. Facts. So I think that all came from comic books. Uh, because, you know, you're going to tell me Wolverine, like, was on his way, you know. He, yeah. he goes berserker. That's the point. Like, he yep. backslides. You know, everybody has that moment. Even Superman, you know, Red Krippin. Like, we get the whole thing. Yeah. You need that. So. I do agree. I kill everybody off and I'll leave you on a cliffhanger and oh well you know I'm not George R. R. Martin I'm never gonna like George R. R. Martin you and make it 10 years always uh. coming back with something and I always write a note to my readers at the end that's my uh, Stan Lee right. thing okay always write you a note I'll let you know what the next title is you know and kind of give you ways to contact me but that's my little Excelsior Stan yeah. Lee and that's another comic book like hats off I grew up with them too, kind of thing. So oh. I think it's definitely influenced even the structure. So I, I do have a question. Like when you're creating a new world, right? Uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Is it a character in the magic system? Was it something else? Uh, how does the process unfold uh, with you uh, in a deep creative space? Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I had no idea what world building or any of that crap meant when I started. I had no idea. I didn't know anything. Once again, if you want to learn what not to do, come talk to me. I had no idea. I just picked up a journal and started writing. Every book has been handwritten first. Okay. I've never, I've never typed a book first. Everything is handwritten. When I started Birth of the Fae, the first six books were never supposed to happen. It was supposed to be volume two. I started writing volume two first. Then as I started writing it, I'd be like, oh, but they're going to want to know this. And I'd pick up another journal and start writing. So they were completely out of order. The names were different. Things were just pieced together after I finished. Volume two was finished. Uh And then everything was written at the same time. So I literally wrote maybe 10 books at the same time, not knowing what I was doing. But I didn't figure it out. Once yeah. I knew dragons were going to be in it, like I knew I wanted ice, acid, fire. Then I yeah. went through and made them, mm-hmm. you know, spent time. I didn't, and the magical system to me, chakras made the most sense. So it wasn't like I was like, hmm, what's the magical system? I was like, it should be chakras. Like that all Ooh. elemental, I knew what I wanted. Gotcha. It went more from gut, from just from going that. with my instinct and gut. Gotcha. That's how it is. So I would love to tell you some really deep answer and give you like the secret sauce. I don't have it at all. Um, <laughs> there, there isn't really one. Um, a lot of the characters' names are people I don't like. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're somebody who's bothering Queen Aurora, most likely you bothered me at some point in my life. And so that's why you're in there. You know, I'm supposed to say like fictional characters, they bear no resemblance, blah, blah, blah. If you think it's you, it's you. Yeah, if you believe me in high school. Contacted you like, hey, is this me in this book? Yeah. If if you had the guts to come up to me, open that page and go, Danielle, I'll look at you and go, yeah, you stuck me in a locker and I named them that. (laughs) It's you. Congratulations. (laughs) You found it. Like, 
<laughs> what do you want me to say? Yep, that's you. You know, the bishops are the bishops because Mr. Bishop hated my God. So they're okay. the bishops. That's it. It's nothing religious. It's just like I was like, hmm, somebody's got to bother Aurora. The bishop, Mr. Bishop, got it. That's it. Uh, uh, so I've got a question. Like, you know, you mentioned before, like, your Yorkie, Carlos, inspired one of your characters. Like, mm -hmm. how much of your personal life finds its way into your books? I mean, you're just talking about it a little bit, like, it probably is you. But how much of that? Is it just like, you know, somebody who pissed you off at the deli or, or the or bodega when you was there? Or is it like, you know, like, is it therapeutic? Or is it even necessary to weave in those personal elements? A lot of me is in the book. Mm. Probably more than you would think. They always say, write what you know. Okay, gotcha. no, I don't know what it's like to have horns. But, um, I know what it's like to talk with your best friend on the beach. Mm. So Serena and Aurora are myself and my friend Jen from high school. That's okay. what those talks are. Serena is Jen. They're, they're, I'm right. not going to hide that. That's who Serena is. Now, why she's a mermaid? Jen looked hot in a bikini. And she would wear a bikini walking into CVS. So oh. Serena's a mermaid. That's it. <laughs> Once again, nothing deep about it. Jen was hot. So I was like, eh, she should be half naked. That's just what it is. Because, okay. you know, Jen would walk in front of guys and literally she'd be like, I'm going to the pool. And she'd be in a bikini in her Victoria's Secret and walk right by. And the pool would be filled two seconds later. So that's why she's that. But she's also ride or die. Okay. Serena is ride or die. Uh, there's a chapter in Locked Out of Heaven called Girl Talk. That's inspired by her and I sitting on, at the beach at Fawnstock thinking we're so deep and sharing life. You know, that's yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. it's everything in Birth of the Face, interpersonal dynamics, taken from, taken from my life. It's just given a magical twist here and there. But that's really all it is. Misunderstandings, you know, looking at the wrong guy, you know, all that kind of stuff, not mm -hmm. fitting in, searching for a meaning, losing identity, found family, wanting to belong. Wow. That, that's life. That's everything I've been through. Right. Uh, you know, it, I'd like to tell you it's something more, but really I just pull from life. Volume two is straight is me you'll open it up and and you'll see morgan nurse at westchester county working in a lyme disease clinic hello like you know wonder woman tattoo on her back yeah it, it's so the only difference i'm not a succubus that's about the yeah. only difference between me and morgan you yeah. know but she's a martial artist it's like that's me the patient mm. that inspired all this is agent graham that's who he is down to what he looks like everything so it is. So uh, the stuff that the doctor pulls with Agent Graham, the stuff that I watched the doctor pull with my patient, and I would really come in and go, isn't he due for an EKG? Just to stop everything because she was talking with them. And she would come down really, really wearing Lou Christian Louboutin's tight outfit, and I would sit there and go, oh, God, here we go again. And I'd have to go in there and be like, it's blood work time. What hospital were you working at? Oh, no, I was in a private clinic, honey. Oh, oh, okay, you got mm -hmm. oh, that's money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of it is me. It, that's yeah. my life. So yeah. the only thing is, no, he wasn't a CIA agent working for a clandestine, you know, supernatural division. Um, he wasn't kidnapping succubi. So, you know, we have some differences. Yeah, yeah, Some yeah, differences. Yeah. But it is therapeutic to kind of work it out. Uh, I will tell people what you'll notice is there's not a lot of biological family stuff mm. involved in my books it is all found family uh. that's a reason um my girls don't fight with each other all my girlfriends are never fighting over a guy you will never see that yeah. i have never had that sex in the city friendship i don't understand wow. that girl thing i've never had it i have jen but i've never had a gaggle of girls where i'm like girlfriend let's go out i've never done it. i've never had martinis with girls i was a fighter my whole life gotcha you can't punch a girl in the face and be like, hey, let's go for drinks. Yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. You can't train. I trained with nothing but guys. Yeah. I miss that part. So I write what I wish I had. See, it's my wife, my different. wife is like that too. 
my wife is like she's such a uh a boy girl you know like mm -hmm. you know like like she used to uh do weightlifting and different mm -hmm. things like that and gotcha. just like run track so she was always around guys consistently and that's the way she kind of operated so i i get you 100%. yeah it's, it's one of those it's weird because you fit in but you don't you're still your oh. own thing and you're trying yeah, to figure yeah. it out so you know i have a character desdemona that's like that she's a virtue angel but not you know she she's exalted from power brigade in the you know in the troop she's the foot soldier and then she gets exalted to this virtue angel status but everybody's looking at her like you're really not one of us uh, she can't go back gotcha. so yes i identify with i know exactly how that feels so so, so there's a, a lot question. of that I, I got a question for you. So, like, you know, you talk about a lot of perseverance, going through a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tough times, especially in your books, with that found family. In your personal life, and you don't have to answer if you, you know, how how did you, I guess, get through those situations, you know, to develop yourself the way that you have? You seem very, very grounded, very, uh, very mature, you know, in, in the way you approach things. You know, but you faced a lot of failure. How did you grow from that? Um, I'm not as put together as I, it's easy to be put together for an hour. First of all, it's very easy for that to do. <laughs> um, so this mask. Um, but I'm still learning very much, especially when it comes to family. Um, it's not that I don't love them. It's nothing like that. And yeah, yeah. but what I've learned is just because someone's blood does not make them good for you. Ooh. Ooh. You are speaking. So um, just because someone is blood doesn't make them good for you. Mm. Blood can still be poisonous. Yes, it Once can. Once in the system, it does damage. And you can know it, but they don't know it. And so they're uh -huh. going to keep banging on that door telling you you're wrong. You're wrong. Usually what I find is when you're growing as a person, Everybody else wants to pull you back down by telling you, no, no, you're crazy. You're the crazy one. <laughs> Look, we're all on the same side. Why are you the one leaving? Especially when you cut people off. They just, they want to tell you you're wrong. And yeah. I'm still dealing with that. You know, mm. the minute you go into therapy and you start growing, everybody else wants to pull you right back. They want to put you in the box that yeah. they know how to deal with you in. Yeah. So if yeah. you were most controlled at 16 years old, they're going to keep looking at you as that 16-year-old, and they're going to keep treating you as that 16-year-old. It doesn't matter if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. They're going back to 16. They're going back to everything you did wrong at 16. Mm -hmm. Because that's how they can deal with you. Gotcha. So as you mature, it's like, well, you're this, you're that. And you're like, are you talking about the party I threw when I was 16? You get I graduated high school a long time ago, right? I can drive, I can boat, I can do all these things. Okay. And they're going back to that moment in time. Because they're so, stuck. Yeah, they're stuck, and you're not. So they're going to uh -huh. pull you back and pull you back. Eventually, uh -huh. you have to cut it off. The poison's uh -huh. in your system. It's coming up the arm. You got you to lose the arm. You might want to keep it because you love that arm, and, uh, you know, you can do a lot of things. You'll be just fine with the other. Got you. There's a lot to do with it. So it's hard. It's still hard, and you'll backslide. But I think the worst thing you can do is go to social media because right now everybody's diagnosing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I think I you guess. have to kind of stay within yourself. As for me, I have a very good support system. Uh, my husband is great. And uh, I have my puppies, believe it or not. Because when you watch a dog, you think about it from the sense of they're taken from their biological family. Mm -hmm. And they have to then adapt to you. They don't care what your baggage is. Yeah, they don't. They don't, you know, they're, they're not judging you. It's how you treat them and how they treat you. If you just did your relationship based solely on that, think about how much happier you would be. They don't care what you did the day before. It's right now. That's what they live in. I learned that watching Carlos. He was born sickly. He's been in pain a lot. But man, that little Muppet face brat is so <laughs> happy. He is so yep. happy. And he gives me love. I give him love. And I yeah. realize that's family. Go with that. And, and, and you're 100% right. 
man. And it's 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 fun to see how you write that into the storyline. And that's I think that's what makes it so interesting, your book's so famous, right? And it's like if we're talking about your influence, you have inspired many creators. You know, like Jim, um, like Jim Henson, Wonder Woman. Uh, what'd you say as your personal Mount Rushmore of creators? Name four um, individuals that you think that would define your journey as an artist. Definitely, I think Chris Claremont's up there. Uh, I think he's okay. definitely up there. I would say Jim Henson, one hundred percent. I try to throw a Muppet quote somewhere in my book. Usually, I feel, have to look, but there's usually something Muppet related in uh-huh. there now um so i would say the muppets are up there i would say wonder woman is there in all sure. iterations whether it's linda carter on um, patty jenkins version you know gal gadot's or the animated versions uh-huh. i know in i believe it's the third book of volume two there is uh-huh. a whole dedication to wonder woman in that sense it might even be stephanie williams forward i gotta look because of the impact she's had on me creatively oh, man. See, I thought you would say Annie Rice or uh, George uh, Perez. I love Anne Rice. I do. Okay. But when I'm looking at who's, as much as I enjoy reading them, uh-huh. when I'm saying, like, who's really affected me, I would say it's probably, I would throw Disney, Walt Disney in there as well. Okay. Because my grandfather knew him, and they drew together. What? And so, from yes, from a very young age, I was obsessed with Mickey Mouse and just moving pictures and you know, that whole thing. So it's not so much the Disney princess, but it was the idea of what Walt Disney could do. His attitude of, oh, they don't have it, let's make it. Oh, they don't do this, well, I'm going to do it. Uh, So it's not so much um, the way he told stories. I think it's amazing, but more of his ingenuity that speaks to me. And that's probably a little bit of the Jim Henson thing too. Though I think with Henson, he could do stories in very, he could take a Muppet and do two very different stories. He could give you the dark side, like Dark Crystal Labyrinth, or he could mm-hmm. give you Muppet, you know, the great Muppet caper. It's like, that's true. to me, yeah. still using puppets, like, that's kind of cool that you can do that and give me a different feel. Yeah. So I will, I will ask, like, you know, we're all about celebrating success here. And I know you have so many incredible moments. So what's one accomplishment that really stands out to you that made you like pause and say, I can't believe I did. I'm not there. I'll be honest wow. with you. I'm not there. Wow. Um, wow. That says a lot. It's not quite. I feel like there are times I feel like I've been close. Mm-hmm. But it's not there because even the books I've done, you know, I've left my publisher, so I've had to start over again, which I'm doing now. They're all being re-released, and it's my solid, my word. Because what I didn't realize is just because you write a manuscript doesn't mean every word's going in. I have gotcha. to learn that one. Um, <laughs> didn't know that. Uh, you know, the audiobooks are getting done. I have, uh, I think, three are released. I have the fourth one coming with the novella, so it'll be From the Ashes Plus Fire Ike. That comes out in a few weeks. They're all getting done voices I want, that kind of stuff. And then Locked Out of Heaven's coming out. Once again, my word with my prologues and little things that are me. Yes. You know, um, this iteration of things, I have all my pop culture references. And so now I have a message from the narrator. So not only do I have my cheeky prologue that I do, I now have the narrator branching off and saying, oh, you thought thought the author was in charge. No, 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 no. Let me tell you. And so in each prologue, there are pop culture references, and he will now tell you what they okay. were and then get on with the story. That's an, I like breaking the fourth wall, and now I'm allowed to do it. Okay. So those are all things that I'm happy, and I'm like, cool, I can finally do that. As for that one thing, no. Yeah, you're not Maybe there when I see it as an anime, yeah. that'll probably be my moment of, that's it. Like, I, I still want that Castlevania-style I want, you know, powerhouse animation to call me and go, we're ready, Danny. Mm-hmm. Let's go. We've got yeah. it. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for that graphic novel. Those kind of things where mm-hmm. I'm in doing, I'm doing the medium that I grew up respecting. Yeah. Then I think I'll stop and go, 
that's kind of cool. All right, yeah, like, yeah, we, we're we somewhere. You know, when Will Arnett calls me and goes, so I want to play Jarba. Do you mind? You know, then I can go, okay, Lego Batman wants to voice Jarba. Yeah, mm-hmm, that sounds about right. You know, that, <laughs> that's when I'm kind of looking at things a little differently. Mm-hmm. You know, in my head, I've already casted everybody's voice. Because, you know, you do that. Everybody does that. I don't care what any author says. When they're like, I don't care about it. Yet you care about a movie and a series. Don't, don't you kid me. You care about yeah. it. You know, when Jensen Ackles is calling me going, so I really want to play Agent Graham. And I'm like, oh, do you? Yes, sir. Let's have lunch. And we can all sit and, and have a few drinks and talk about it. Mm-hmm. But I'm not quite there yet. I'm better because I'm more in control. And that feels mm-hmm. really good. I don't care about the stigma of being self-published. I really don't because I've been traditionally published. Uh, it's the, the grass is not greener yeah it's just 100%. people with their noses up in the air that's got it. you okay okay well danielle thank you so much for sharing today i really appreciate you opening up and wrapping thank these things up with us and um i want you to talk more about you know what you're going to promote what's coming out in the next couple of weeks uh the floor is yours please take it away thank you very much for having me first of all and for everybody who has spent the time listening to me ramble I really do appreciate that, first and foremost. Um, we have a bunch of things coming out. All the audiobooks will be on Audible, and everywhere you get your audiobooks, they'll be there. They're done by Skyboat Media. Stefan Rudnecki, who is a Grammy winner, is most of, you know, everybody knows him pretty much now as King Jarbach. Uh, mm-hmm. His partner, Gabrielle, is doing my female voices, so I have two narrators in the books, which I love tremendously. And Locked Out of Heaven is already out, Vine Eyes of Mercy is out, and from the Ashes with the novella by Rice Acid is coming out and then Kingdom Come. So you'll be able to binge four books. Uh, Faye is Done is already recorded. Mm-hmm. And Forgive Us is being recorded right now. And that will also have the novella of Danius and Jaden at the Heart of War. So you'll be able to binge the whole series probably before Thanksgiving. Okay. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then the books are all being re-released in ebook, paperback as well, okay. with artwork finally. Character art will be included in everything. And then I will be doing vellum inserts for people who love the artwork. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of excited about that. And volume two is finished. When I'm going to release it, I'm thinking about it. Not quite sure. I'm noodling that around a little bit because it does take place in Westchester County during a very specific time of year. So I may want to coordinate that. Mm. And yeah, I'm not sure. I have two shows. I have Liberty Bell Smack on uh, WDB. AM 860 in Philadelphia, where I I just rile up the crowd and talk about the New York Giants. But you can catch that Thursdays at 6 p.m. And you can listen online on Facebook live stream. And then I have my own show coming out talking about my experiences as a person and as an author called Once Upon an Author. That starts October 15th at 5.30 on WWDB AM 860. But it will be live streamed on Facebook. You can listen to it live through their website and other things, but Instagram is the best place to catch me. I'll have it all up there at Birth of the Fae underscore novel. But I am going to finally divulge everything that's happened in the publishing world and just how this little smirk decided to start writing and everything that came to be, <laughs> including oh. everything that's happened from working with The Rock and him having to tell people don't pl- throw me through a plate glass window that, when they wanted to to you know what it's been like growing up as you know half puerto rican half italian when you don't really look puerto rican and you can't play with the kids and uh you know teaching everybody what the word ambassador means in fourth grade or Mm -hmm. when i'm four years old i think i did it because i wanted to be like wonder woman and wearing my underoos till they fell off all that Uh, good stuff you know all the normal stuff thinking that the world you know monologues like jd from scrubs and then finding out oh they don't that was a little bit of a thing. You know, nursing school is not going to be like Scrubs either at all. Yep. At all. So all that stuff will be on Once Upon an Author, which is coming out October 15th. Okay. okay. Well, wow. You have a lot going on, and I cannot wait. I, I got my phone because I, I love audiobooks. I consistently listen to at least maybe two audiobooks a week. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do personal development. I do a lot of... uh. Um, anime and uh, you know uh, sci-fi, uh, different books as well. When uh, on my off time, if I if I get through my personal development book, then I have to go to my uh, like sci-fi anime and stuff like that uh, book. So 
I consistently consume, consume our content. So yeah. You uh, give me your audible me. email and I will send you, I will gift you locked out of heaven. Okay. Heck, heck after this. Yes. Well, definitely. You give it to me. I will gift you locked out of heaven. And then from there, if you like it, we'll go from there. But I okay. guarantee, I guarantee you'll like it. Guarantee I, it. I know. But you I, I, check that I, out. I know. Okay. Well, thank you, Danielle, for such an inspirational conversation and for the laughs. Man, I truly love laughing. I truly love just uh, conversating with you. You are a jack of all trades and, like you said, a master of none. And you are just amazing from your journeys as a nurse to fantasy, from martial arts to cosplay. Uh, it is nothing short but amazing. You are amazing. And I can't wait to see what's next coming. October 15, guys, make sure you look out for this woman. She's doing a lot of different things, especially um, on radio. So check her Instagram page out. It's going to be amazing. So, all right. Peace. Thank you. And now I'm just...